Chapter 5 of Other Eternal and Imminent Acts in God, particularly Adoption and Justification. I shall not here treat of these as doctrines in the full extent of them, or as blessings of grace actually bestowed upon, and enjoyed by believers with all the privileges and advantages arising from thence, or as transient acts passing on them and terminating in their consciences at believing, but as internal and imminent acts taken up in the mind of God from eternity, and which abide in his will, in which they have their complete being, as eternal election has, being of the same kind and nature, and are ranked with it as the same date, and as branches of it, Ephesians 1, 4-6. In the other view of them, they will be considered hereafter in course, in a proper place, I shall begin with 1. Adoption. As predestination to it stands next to election, Ephesians 1, 5, which is no other than his will to adopt the chosen ones, which is his adoption of them. For as the will of God to elect any is his election of them, so his will to adopt the same is his adoption of them, and the complete essence of it lies in his will, and is as much an eternal imminent act of it, in like manner as election is, and may be considered as a branch of it, at least of the same nature with it, and which agrees with the sense of the words adopto, from whence adoption comes, which is compounded of ad, to, and octo, to choose. So that adoption is God's choice or election of some to be his children, and by this option or choice of his they become so. The Greek word for adoption throughout the New Testament is, is a word which signifies putting among the children, a phrase used by God, Jeremiah 3.19, how shall I put them among the children, or a putting one for in the room of a son, that is a stranger and not a son by birth, a constituting and accounting such as one as a son, according to choice, will and pleasure, and divine adoption is an act of the sovereign grace and goodwill of God, Ephesians 1.5 to which he is not induced by any motive out of himself, not by an excellency in the creature, nor from want of a son, one or other of which is the case with the human adoptions, as Moses, a goodly child, by Pharaoh's daughter, and Esther, a beautiful person, and a relation to Mordecai. But divine adoption is of persons exceeding, unworthy, and undeserving, nothing engaged in them, not only strangers, but children of wrath, even as others. And like the wretched infant in Ezekiel 6, 1-63, it is an act of distinguishing grace. It is of men and not angels who were servants and not sons, at least not by adoption, and some of them are not of all, though all are alike in their nature state, and it is an amazing act of unmerited love and free grace, 1 John 3, 1. Now, this is an eternal act of grace. First, it did not begin in time but commence from eternity. It is an act of God's will, and has its complete essence in it, and the will of God is eternal. No new will, nor any new act of his will arises in God in time, or otherwise he would not be the unchangeable God he is. 1. It is an act that does not first take place at believing. Indeed, the saints are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus, openly and manifestly, Galatians 3, 26. But then it is not faith that makes them children. But what makes them appear to be so? Adoption is the act of God, not of faith. It is God that says, How shall I put them among the children? And again, I will be their father, and they shall be my sons and daughters. Jeremiah 3.19, 2 Corinthians 6.18. It is the work and business of faith to receive the blessing of adoption which he could not do unless it had been previously provided for them in the mind and by the will of God, and in the covenant of grace, for the reception of which Christ has made way by his redemption, one end of which is that we might receive the adoption of sons. Galatians 4 verse 5. That is by faith, for God has appointed faith to be the general receiver of Christ and of all the blessings of him through him, and this among the rest. And to as many as receive Christ, he gives the power, or authority, dignity, and privilege to become the sons of God openly. 
That is to claim this as their privilege and dignity, which claim is made by faith, but not the thing itself claimed, even to them that believe on his name, who are described as regenerate persons, which is an evidence of their sonship, though not the thing itself, who are born, not of blood, nor of the will of flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. 1 John 12, 13 But through this describe as such who are the sons of God openly, and who believe yet. 2. Adoption does not first commence at regeneration. Adoption and regeneration are two distinct blessings, and the one is previous to the other, though they are commonly confounded together by divines. Regeneration is not the foundation of adoption, but adoption the foundation of regeneration, or the reason why men are adopted is not because they are regenerated, but they are regenerated because they are adopted. By adoption they are put into the relation of children, and by regeneration they have a nature given them suitable to that relation, and are made partakers of the divine nature, that they may be made known to be heirs apparent to, and have a meekness for the possession, enjoyment and use of it, and the inheritance in heaven they are adopted to. 4. 3. The act of adoption is previous to any work of the Spirit of God upon the hearts of his people. Because ye are sons, sons already, sons by adopting grace, God hath set forth the Spirit of his Son into your hearts, both to convince, convert, regenerate, and effectually call by his grace, and sanctify, and also to comfort, and to enable to cry, Abba, Father, witnessing to our spirits that they are the children of God, and hence he is called the Spirit of Adoption. And it is his influence, teachings, leadings, which are the evidences of adoption, for as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. Not that those influences, operations and leadings make them, but make them evident to be such. Galatians 4, 6, Romans 8, 14 to 16. 4. Divine adoption or sonship took place before the work of Christ was wrought in time, for any of the sons of men. It was before his incarnation and birth, for as much then, or because the children are partakers of flesh and blood, the children of God, who are so by adopting grace, therefore he also, Christ, himself took part of the same. For though the nature he assumed was what was in common to all mankind, yet he assumed it with a particular view to the children of God, the spiritual seed of Abraham, whose nature he is said to take, and for which sake he was the child born, the son given. Isaiah 9, six, Hebrew 2.14 And in consequence, they must be the children of God before Christ suffered and died. And indeed, he suffered and died for them under this character, considered as the children of God by adopting grace. For he died not only for the elect of God among the Jews, but also that he should gather together in one the children of God that were scattered abroad, that is, those who were already the children of God by adopting grace, who were scattered throughout the whole Gentile world. This relates to the gathering of all the elect in one, in Christ, in the dispensation of the fullness of times, when Christ suffered as their security, head and representative, and when they were all considered as the children of God, whether in heaven or on earth, and whether among the Jew or Gentiles, Ephesians 1.10, John 11.51.52. And in order to bring those many sons to glory, it became him to be made perfect through sufferings, and that through his redemption of them, thereby they might receive actually in their own persons the adoption before provided for them, as before observed. See Hebrews 2.10, Galatians 4.5. Secondly, adoption is an act of God's free grace from all eternity. 1. The elect of God are frequently spoken of as a distinct number of men given to Christ, and as previous to their coming to him by faith, which is the certain fruit and consequence of that grace. See John 17, 2, 6, 9, 24, 6, 37. Yea, they were given to Christ before the world was. For, if grace was given to them in him before the world began, they themselves must be given to him, and be in him before the world began. 2 Timothy 1, nine. Now these were given to Christ in the relation of children, and therefore must be children so early. Behold, I and the children which God hath given me. Hebrews 2.13 2. The elect of God were espoused to Christ in eternity, 
as has been shown in the preceding chapter, which serves to illustrate and prove the relation of sonship to God so early. For as in natural and civil marriage, if a man marries a king's daughter, he becomes his son-in-law, as David to Saul, or if a woman marries a king's son, she becomes a king's daughter. So the elect of God, his church, and people, being espoused to the Son of God, they become sons and daughters of the Lord God Almighty, the King of Kings, and hence the church is called the King's Daughter. Psalm 45.13 And these persons, being betrothed to Christ, the Son of God, in eternity, as they were the spouse of Christ, they must be, and must be, considered as being the sons of God so early. 3. The elect of God were taken by him into the covenant of grace, as children, the sum and substance of which runs thus, I will be a father unto you, and you shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. 2 Corinthians 6.18 Now, this covenant was from everlasting, as the setting up of Christ the mediator of it so soon. And the promises and the blessings made and provisions before the world began so abundantly testify. Besides, in this covenant, these same persons so early were given to Christ as his seed and offspring, his children, and he commenced the everlasting father of them. Isaiah 9, 6, 53, verse 10. 4. Predestination to the adoption of children is mentioned along with election, as of the same date with it, and as an illustration of it, and as an addition to it, or rather a branch of it, as men by election are not only chosen to holiness, but to adoption and the inheritance annexed to it, Ephesians 1, 4, 5. Adoption is a sentence of grace conceived in the divine mind and settled by the divine will, and pronounced in divine predestination, which is an eternal act of God, and so says Dr. Amos, Adoption is a gracious sentence of God, which sentence is pronounced in the same variety of degrees as justification, for it was first pronounced in divine predestination. Ephesians 1 5. Afterwards in Christ, Galatians 4 5, then in believers themselves, Galatians 4 6. And all these pronunciations, and so all that Christ did in redemption respecting this, all the Spirit of God does in revealing, applying, and witnessing it, yea, all that will be done in eternity to come. For though now the saints are the sons of God, it doth not yet appear clearly and fully what they shall be, even as sons, or with dignity and glory they shall be raised unto, in consequence of this relation. I say all this in time and to eternity serve only to open and expand the original act of God's will in appointing and constituting them his sons in an eternity past.